we are at a very critical moment in the history of life on this planet. I'm here to tell you we're in trouble. And if you don't listen, we're in more trouble than we're ever going to be. These are people of the land, and they're telling us, look, there's no debate about is climate change happening. It's happening. And the consequences are going to get more and more severe if we don't do something about it. This came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a couple months ago. Uh, these are the projections for climate change out to the year 2100. Uh, the left figure is an aggressive climate policy where we get climate change in check and our carbon emissions only lead to about a, a, a two degree warming globally uh, over the next hundred years. On the right is a do nothing scenario and if you take a look at the scale on the bottom in the Arctic, uh, in the next hundred years we could see a warming by 10 to 11 degrees Celsius. Again, unprecedented, unfathomable. The Arctic is connected to all of us and this will cause immense challenges for everybody, not just residents in these places. In 1988, there was a major meeting of climatologists from around the world in Toronto. And, and the climatologists were so concerned about global warming at that time that they said the evidence is in and that this represented a threat to human survival second only to all-out nuclear war. And in 1988, they called for a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 15 years. Think if we had listened to them and paid attention and done it. Why did we then drop the ball? Well, we went into a slight recession, but even more than that, the the fossil fuel industry itself, led by Exxon, began to spend tens of millions of dollars in a campaign of confusion. It's junk science, they said. It's natural. The evidence simply isn't in. Cl sci climate scientists are just a bunch of grubby people out there trying to get bigger grants and make more money. They're not to be trusted any more than, uh, than we are. And it worked. This year, the IPCC came out with it, its latest report. Five years ago, they said it is a 90% certainty that humans are burning fossil fuel and causing climate change. And it was urgent that we act on, in reducing our emissions. Now, five years later, having done nothing except increase our emissions all over the world, the next IPCC report came out. They're 95% certain that humans are causing it by burning fossil fuel, and now it is extremely urgent that we have to act. The IPCC latest report just came out a few weeks ago, and immediately, and the report said that the effect of climate change is being felt on every continent on the planet now. It's undeniable and, in, and is already demonstrable. Immediately, the media began to say, oh, it's too alarmist, uh, it's too, uh, it's too de depressing, it's, it's uh, pessimistic, it's strident. I would hope it's alarmist. You know, these scientists are the sentinels of the future, the sentinels for society to look ahead at what's coming to warn us. We have two great books. We have the white man's book. Yes, I read the white man's book, and I learned many, many things from the white man's book. From the time I was born, I started reading Mother Nature's book. And Mother Nature's book, along with the white man's book, has given me the education I need to do these things I need to do. Yes, there is lots in the white man's book, and we need it. But we also need Mother Nature's book. I believe that we as environmentalists have fundamentally failed. Oh, the, when the environmental movement began in 1962, it was very, very successful. Because of that movement, we got departments of the environment. We got laws to protect air, water, soil, endangered species. Millions of hectares of land were saved as parks all around the world. That was the result of the environmental movement. But many of the battles that we celebrated as victories we're living to fight them again today because we didn't use those victories to, to change, to transform people, to see a different way of living on the planet. And that is our failure. We haven't shifted the paradigm.
For me, the relationship with the land is, is a spiritual one. Our traditional beliefs are rooted deeply in, in the earth. We have to give voice to all of those people, the people in these videos, the people in the communities that are feeling and experiencing the, the direct impacts of out-of-control fossil fuel development and the, the impacts of climate change across the globe. And so when I think about what kind of leadership do we need, it's more about building the bridges to create real leaders. Because I feel like the current leadership that we have in power has missed the point of what it means to lead a country or lead their people. We are losing sight of who we are and where we've come from. Canada, along with all of the other countries at Copenhagen, agreed we must limit temperature rise in this century to two degrees. And as McKibben rightly points out, once you make that commitment, we know by the laws of physics exactly how much more carbon we can add to the atmosphere before we pass that two degree rise, and that's 565 gigatons of carbon. Now that number doesn't mean a damn thing to me, but 565 gigatons is what physics dictates we must not exceed. And as was pointed out, we, in the known reserves, we have five times that much. So if we are serious about this commitment, 80% of what we've got has got to be left in the ground. I'm actually learning a lot about the health impacts of coal-fired power plants. And those coal-fired power plants are, it's a dirty fuel. It produces uh, nitrous oxides, it produces sulfur dioxide, it produces ozone, particulate matter, uh, mercury, heavy metals, and, and all of these, uh, there's well-founded science that says that this, this impacts the health of, of, of people that are exposed to this. But what I realized was that it's the public health aspects that capture the media's attention, that really focus the media on this issue. They go, wow, 100 people dying a year, that is big news. You know, we don't talk about the hundreds of thousand people that, that could be dying from this in 40 years, because that's, that's verboten. And one person I want to talk about is Silawat Kluche. Uh, she's an Inuk from Nunavut who got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for linking climate change and human rights. And this idea of the human dimension of climate change. We need to start seeing this as a human issue, not just stats and charts and figures. This affects us all. This affects human beings. And she was amongst the first, this voice from the Arctic, saying it's human beings that we need to be thinking about. For those of us in New Brunswick, that believe the science, the human testimony, the First Nations, the academic community. Um, I guess for me, as someone that does believe in what you're saying, I just want to know what gives you hope in this fight, in, our, in humanity's greatest challenge, this planet's greatest challenge. That's all I have. I'm enough of a realist and a scientist to see where all the curves are going. Indeed, many of my colleagues have said it's too late. But the one thing I have is hope, and what I say to people who say it's too late is, you don't know enough to say that. And this isn't a Pollyanna-ish kind of, oh, well, don't worry, good things will happen. No, it's the fact that we don't know enough. You know, the most precious species of salmon is the sockeye salmon. It's a salmon with a bright red fatty flesh that we all love. And the biggest run of sockeye salmon is in the Fraser River in British Columbia. Now, tradi traditionally, if we got a run of 25 to 35 million sockeye, that was considered a good run. And uh, three years ago, we got just over one million sockeye coming back. And I said to my wife, that's it. There isn't enough biomass. They're simply not going to make it. The government uh, has set up a royal commission to look at what the hell happened to those sockeye. One year later, we got the biggest sockeye run in 100 years. Nobody knows what happened but nature surprised us and I believe we don't know enough to say nature doesn't have all kinds of surprises up her pocket the challenge for us is to pull back and give nature a chance <laughs>